<laughs> Chet. <laughs> Morning. Morning. There's someone that you remind me of with that haircut. Uh, who's that? I can't tell you. <laughs> it's not Stalin. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that those will be uh, distributed out. So we're going to do mainly the thrust that we're drawing from is the churches that are hopefully the churches will be reaching out to people that they know uh, or within that group and then go forward from there. So uh, that's going to be this week. I was starting to, I, I went to a few churches and I kind of got checked on the Lord to wait, you know what? There's one part of this thing that's missing on it and that's the poster so when you get done you hand the letter to the pastor, he's got something to put up there and that continues to speak after you've tried to explain everything or after they read the letter. So that's what's happening there. So what you're going to see is just this 15 minute uh, interview with Pat Robertson, which is a little bit different than his presentation that he'll be doing at the Red Lion. So this one probably isn't as impacting, I think, as his presentation uninterrupted, because this has got some questions to it and some comments. Um, so we're going to look at that first, and then uh, go into the message, and then go into the worship. So, okay, so I'm ready there, Lars, thanks. Talking about the ultimate for all of us. Where do we go after we die? What about heaven? What about hell? What does the Bible say? And what about people who've actually been there? Well, we've got first-hand testimonies. But according to a Harris poll, 69% of Americans believe in hell. But only 1% think they're going to go there. They're going to have some people very surprised. But do they believe in a literal hell of fire and brimstone? Bill no, Weiss does. He says he spent 23 minutes in hell. November 22nd, 1998, was a typical night for Bill and Annette Weiss. They spent the evening with friends, then came home and went to bed around midnight. About three hours later, Bill felt himself lifted from his bed and hurled through the air. He landed on the hard floor of a prison cell. So a strange story is told in a book called 23 Questions About Hell and also 23 Minutes in Hell. Bill Weiss is here with us. Bill, good to have you. Well, great to be with you, Pat. It's an honor to be with you. Hi. You're, you're a nominal church member, I, I guess. Are you more than nominal? You're a dedicated church member. Full time. 41 years I've been involved in yeah. church and ministry. Before this thing happened to you, you were, you were asleep. Yes, we went to a prayer meeting, came home like any other normal night, yeah. and I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water, mm -hmm. and suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being sucked out of your body, and I found myself falling through the air, and I landed in this actual prison cell in hell, rough hewn stone walls, bars, a filthy, stinking, dirty prison, like a dungeon. Yeah. Now, this was an out-of-body experience, this was okay. uh, a vision, okay? okay. Uh, I've never had one like this before, but anyway, it was actually a prison cell, and uh, there were these demonic creatures in this cell. What were they like? Reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over their bodies. Yeah. Uh, these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. There's even scripture for that, but... Um, Did they look like anything that you've ever seen a picture of? Yes. <clears throat> they had, they, there's some depictions that are pretty accurate. Uh, one was in uh, Dr. Kenneth Hagin's testimony that uh, John Osteen's church showed about a demon that he saw, Dr. Kenneth Hagin. What did they do to you? What did they do? They were, first of all, they were blaspheming and cursing God in extreme hatred for God. They were deformed, twisted, grotesque creatures, and then they directed that hatred towards me. I wonder why, what have I done to them? But the one picked me up, threw me into the wall, tremendous strength. I collapsed on the floor, I felt bones broken. The other one dug his claws into my chest, tore the flesh open. You have a body in hell, but it can withstand this torment. And uh, they had absolutely no mercy. An extreme hatred for God and for man. No mercy at all? None. No. Not any. Okay, when you were in the cell by yourself with these creatures, was there anybody else around? At this point I was alone, yes. just with these creatures. And they began tormenting me. I did feel pain, but I understood most of it was being blocked. And the Lord explained to me on the way back that He did allow me to feel some of the pain.
to relate to people that it's not metaphorical or allegorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. Well, what about the way the fire thing? Were you? Was there fire somewhere? Yes, yeah, so I was taken out of the cell and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. Mm -hmm. This pit was not the lake of fire I talked about in Revelation 2013 through 15, but it's the current hell, Sheol. And was, this pit was just a huge cat. A hole in the ground with flames raging high up in this open cavern. And again, it wasn't metaphorical or allegorical, real literal flames. And Pat, this is where I could first see people. There were people literally inside this pit burning. It's the most awful sight to see a person on fire, burning, screaming. The screams were so loud from just millions of people at the top of their lungs screaming. What were they, what were they saying? Nothing, Nick. You, you can't scream. say anything. You're just screaming in agony. There's no conversation. You don't get to be with people. You're kept isolated and apart. And the, the demons are tormenting people. Uh, you, you have no conversation. The, the smells are so foul and putrid. The most disgusting odors. And you're actually breathing in sulfur. And uh, sulfur that's burning is actually toxic. So I wondered how could it be alive breathing this toxic, foul air? But you continue living. Uh, there's not enough air to breathe either. So you have to fight and gasp breathing the tiniest bit of oxygen. What about water? No water. There's not a drop of water. I, I was so thirsty. Just a drop would have been precious like the rich man wanted in Luke 16. But you'll never get that drop. That, that rich man's still waiting for that drop. Well, well those people, you know, you'd think that they would uh, expire, that they would die, but apparently they can't die. The body you're equipped with in hell, it, you live forever. Because, you know, we're made eternal beings yes. in God's image. And so our soul is eternal. <coughs> you know, like the burning bush. Mm -hmm. You saw it burning and it didn't, wasn't consumed. That's something like what it's like in hell with your body. It can withstand these torments. And you want to die. I wanted to die, but you can't die. You know, that's the most horrible thing when you think about it. Just to think that there's no end. That there is no end. Well, Pat, that was the worst part. I understood that I'll never get out. Uh -huh. Never. And to know you'll be there for all eternity, without hope. You know, Isaiah 38, 18 says, Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. You have no hope for Jesus, because it's too late for them. The decision's final. And that's really the worst part, knowing you're not ever going to get out. You know, that, that, that just grabs people's hearts. I hope the people listen to your testimony will understand what that is. There isn't anything more horrible where you have no hope, no future, nothing except constant pain and torment forever. It's the most horrible thing. People's minds can't even imagine the horrors of hell. Your mind can't even go there. Any one of these things would kill you. And, and the darkness, I only could see a little bit through the flames, but the darkness is, just consumes any of the light from the flames. It is so dark that you can actually feel the darkness. Exodus 10.21 talks about a darkness that may be felt. So that's not an exaggeration because there's so much evil and wickedness in this place. There's no love of any kind. You understand you're never going to get rescued. There's no angels to protect you. There's no one to talk to. You're not going to get out of this place. No one to talk to. There's no, no fellowship. None. You know, None. You're not going to get out. You're not people going to think there's going to be a lot of their buddies in hell. It doesn't work that way. That doesn't work that way. You're alone. You're alone forever. Forever. And that's why people need to know how important this decision is to make that we have in life here. You know, we serve a loving God. He doesn't want anybody to go to this place. It was made for the devil and his angels, not for man. But man will go there. Because God loves man so much, he gave them a free will to choose. Yeah. You know, and he said, uh, your own words will condemn you. Did you... I finally cried to Jesus. How did you get out? Well, when I was viewing all this torment, people burning in the fire, I began to lift up through this tunnel. And that's where this bright light appeared. Suddenly this bright light. I knew immediately who it was. I didn't see his face, but I saw the outline of a man standing in this bright, pure, holy light. Yeah. Like no light I've ever seen. And I immediately knew who it was. And I just cried out his name, Jesus. And he said, I am. I collapsed at his feet. Uh, I don't know if I died, but he touched me. And when I came to, I started having thoughts, and he would answer my thoughts. And it was many thoughts. I don't have time to go through them all here. But uh, yeah, I, I thought, Lord, why did you send me to that horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Which that statement surprised me, because I thought all Christians believe in hell. But many of them do not. They believe in annihilationism, or universalism, or soul sleep. None of that's true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, that these shall go into everlasting life, and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the same word, everlasting, Ionios. 
So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell. But it's a, it's a place. I mean, the only thing you're saying it's not a place. It's, it's a real geographical location. I understood I was down deep in the earth. I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember Jesus said, you shall receive the greater damnation, referring as a lesser. But like, the point is, there is no comfortable level in hell. They're all horrendous beyond any Why are they there? Did you find out why the Lord sent these people to hell when they went to hell? They went to hell because they denied Jesus as their personal Savior. Yes. They had the choice in life and they rejected him. Even though God offered himself to people throughout their whole lives, mm -hmm. uh, people on their own, they re reject. The only way is knowing Jesus Christ and repenting of your sins. And if you don't do that, you will end up in this place. And I don't care what you're raised with. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you will end up in this place for all eternity. That's horrible to contemplate. It is. It's horrible. It is the most horrible thing. That's why God wants us as Christians to share the gospel. And he doesn't want anyone to go to this place. He wept when he saw people falling back in this tunnel that we came out of. It hurts him to see people going into hell. But again, because he loves man, he gives him that choice. He tells you clearly how to stay out of there. Yeah. You know, in Revelation 21, it says, All unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So he tells you, if you don't believe my word, you will end up there. So it's their own words that condemn them and send them there. What's it going to do after you? You're only 23 minutes. You came by. 23 seconds would be enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's changed my life. I yeah. left my career in real estate. My wife and I travel full time in the ministry just to share information with people. You know, this is not a message of condemnation. This is simply a message of warning. And I explain to people, it's not important they believe my experience. What's important is that they check out what the Word of God has to say. Did you why you were chosen to go there? I have no idea. I'm the least likely. I was not a Billy Graham. I just was a real estate broker going to work. I had my own company. I'm a conservative person. I did not feel comfortable sharing this experience. But the Lord had me share it. And now I don't mind the uncomfortableness because if one person can be led to the scripture, I'm just a signpost to point people to the scripture. Were you terrified when you got pulled out of your body? Were you terrified? I was terrified beyond anything I can ever explain. Uh -huh. And I'm a calm person by nature, and I know something about fear. I was attacked by a tiger shark, a 10-foot tiger shark, pulled down under the water when I used to surf, and it grabbed my leg. And, and so that fear I experienced then paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even compare. And there was no end to it. That's the no end. No end. But oh, God bless you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this book, by the way, is uh, oh. in hell. You want to get it. It's Thanks, place. Lars. So, I mean, um, question, though. I, there was a, a couple experiences I had one time that um, I'm going to go. We can go ahead and turn that to the um, to the teaching. Is <clears throat> when I worked underground mine. In Rock Springs, uh, I was a young guy, real young at the time, and uh, we were a half mile down, and then you get in what they call the cage, and that's a, you're standing on a, a grate that you can look down past your feet on this metal grate, and the, the very bottom is a little light that was about the size of, a, you know, looks like a pencil head eraser, and um, that would be your landing place, and so this this elevator which would carry about uh, 15 guys 20 guys would drop at such a fast rate that the wind coming up from the bottom you'd have to put your keep your hand on your hard hat as you're going down and it would race uh, and it took a, a considerable amount of time it was about like I said it's about a half mile down and then when you get to the landing zone uh, where you, you get out of your cage they would have these great big earth movers, those belly scrapers that you'd see. That's how big the landing place was. And then you'd file out and you'd get onto what they call a man trip, which is a, like a little flat jeep. And it's about maybe just above, just below your hip in height. And you'd sit and your crew of seven would travel seven miles underground. And you've got your, your helmet lights on. And sometimes the ceiling would dip down, so everybody's like looking ahead because they're got to drop their head down, otherwise they'd you know scrape it on the ceiling, they, or the lid as they called it. And then you get to your to your work face site. Uh, I was a roof bolter, and so what I would do is they would take 30 sticks of dynamite, and they would go back 20 or 30 feet into the face, and then they would hit it, and it would blow that entire face off. Uh, that would be your work zone that you'd probably spend for the next four to six hours. Right after they'd blow that off, then I was the first one that would go in after that. Of course, they would check for gases and things like that, toxic gases. Uh, 
that would kill people. And once the air was cleared, the percussion, I remember from those 36 of dynamite, the percussion coming down the, the, the work area was so, would create such a wind, it literally took my, my paper bag lunch and literally blew it across the floor. I thought we were in a cave in the first time, and they were all watching me, waiting for my reaction, you know. So I'd go up there, and I would have this uh, probably a 25-foot uh, crowbar, metal one. And then my job was to go up there and pry all the loose rock off the ceiling. And some of those pieces that would fall off would be as big as uh, pickup truck beds. They would just boom. Uh, with great warning, you'd go up there and do that until all the loose pieces were off. Then they'd go up there and then they'd break all those large pieces and they would take a machine that would go in there and then put them on a conveyor belt and you'd clean that area up. And so that all would be, the rock, the ore would be removed. That was Trona from where we make auto glass and soap and things like that. That's what we were mining. Um, when that was all cleaned up, then I would have to go back in again and I would uh, put holes in the ceiling about every three square feet and those would be bolts that would be anywhere from 15 to 20 feet long. And then they would screw those into the ceilings and that would support the ceiling from caving in. And we start that thing all over again. But on occasion, I would have to go back and get some roof bolts. And I remember on one occasion getting in that, my man trip and it, you're going through what they call the, the dead zone. And the dead zone is where they, they string this burlap across these, these series of honeycomb tunnel areas so that they can route all the fresh air from up on top through the working zones. And when I was back there in the dead zone, you move this great big thick burlap curtain and you drive through it. And then you go like 14 places down and three to the right and two forward again. Got to remember your way. And there would be a pile of these roof bowls stored. So I went back there and I'm probably about a half mile from my work area underground even. And I shut my man trip off, the engine, the lights, and clicked off my helmet light. And when he talked about a darkness that you could feel, like the darkness that was in Egypt that you could feel, it creeped me so fast. And the first thing that rushed into my mind was, what if my lights don't work? <laughs> that was the first thing that hit. I mean, they knew where I was at, but I, the first thing I thought about, what if my man trip doesn't start? What if my helmet light doesn't work? And the, and the dead, stagnant air that's back there, and the heat would be probably 105 degrees where I was at, you know, because uh, there's no fresh moving air coming through the tunnel. And it creeped me out so bad, and I'm thinking to myself, man, this has got to be what, and I was, wasn't even a Christian at the time. And, and I said to myself, this has got to be what hell's like. And so I, I turned around, and, you know, and I drove back to my place, and just being able to turn the light on on my man trip and turn my helmet light on was like this this intense relief that just came on to me like this security in the light and there's uncertainty in the darkness and i can't imagine a person like bill weiss being in that condition even for 23 minutes or people that are there in that condition when the outer darkness is what the scripture talks about i can't imagine them being in that circumstance where there's zero hope no hope and no ending and to think that you can't uncreate yourself you can't call an end to yourself there is no opportunity to end that someone said to me one time well how could a god of such magnificent love as the christians preach do something like that how could that happen well first off there's we we can only conceptualize eternal states we, we can't experience them because we we're not even though we are eternal right now, we live in this transient sort of um, state, condition, if you will, that we measure everything by the increments of time. And we can change that. We can go from seasons and we can go temperatures and we have all these different variables that we work with. But it's difficult for us, if not impossible on this side of heaven or this side of hell either way, to conceptualize as it may be the, the, to grasp what eternity is like, an eternal state. It's difficult to conceptualize the state of heaven. I mean, the bliss, the color, the sounds, the joy, the peace, where there's not one tear, where all needs are met, where we will see loved ones again. 
it's, it's, it's difficult to try to imagine that. That's all you can do is imagine it. Well, on the other side of that, it's, it's difficult to imagine the inverse of that as well. Now, let me give you another extreme that's difficult to imagine. Difficult to conceive, to, to, to grasp the concept of. In fact, I will tell you that I think it's impossible on this side of heaven. And that is, to behold a holy, perfect, righteous per person, God, who has never known any sin, and in whose presence sin cannot stand, and in whose presence sickness and disease cannot exist. And to be standing in the presence of His love with such saturated intensity, and then to think that this same one, this same, the one that loves us, put on the flesh and came as Jesus Christ and then took sin. Now, if, if you, and see, we can't grasp, we can't grasp the destructive power or the death of sin. We can't grasp that because we can't contrast that to something we can't grasp as well, which is the righteous, perfect state of God. So we're stuck in this middle between the concepts only trying to understand something in, in, the, in the minuscule fragments of what it is, but not really being able to grasp it. And it's almost like when you read the Bible, it's an understatement. You know, Jesus fasted 40 days and, says, and he was hungry. I would be ripping into a restaurant and holding it at gunpoint to eat at 40 days. <laughs> and he goes, and he was hungry. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, everything seems to be an understatement in the scripture. So it says that Jesus ascended in front of the, the apostles and they watched him go up into heaven. And an angel says, what, hey boys, what are you looking up there for? The same Jesus will return the same way that he has left. You know, and, so he, and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. None of that we can grasp. We can read the words. But how do you grasp something in that state when it's only the rhetoric of the words? You can't do it. So, I am rather certain that Bill Weiss, when he comes here on March 20th, is, probably feels as frustrated as anything else, is, is, is how is he able to convey this thing for what, in the state that what it is, when there aren't words enough to express a pain that never stops, or a life in torment that doesn't quit, or how do you, you can't, you can't do that. So what we can do is we can embark upon a pilgrimage to make as much discovery and show ourselves as faithful before the Lord as anything we can do right now. That's what's really incredibly important to us. So, how many here uh, are formerly members of the Catholic Church? Raise your hands. Just Jane? That's it? Jane, you're the only, you're the only, oh, two? Okay. How about, how about Baptists? Anybody Baptists? Raise your hands. Well, clearly the Baptists outnumber the Catholics here. <laughs> Lutherans? Some of you are Baptists and Lutherans. <laughs> okay, so Presbyterians, Methodists. It, it, see, look at all that. Um, you were Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, and Lutheran, weren't you? <laughs> you were the alphabet soup, Ron. <laughs> so, it's, just stop and think for a second here. Now, we grew up, I was raised Lutheran. We grew up in a perspective. And in the Lutheran Church, I never heard of the Holy Spirit, never heard anything about the Holy Spirit, uh, other than he's a mention of, he's a, of the triune nature of God. But, but we all come from these different uh, addresses and these different perspectives and these different experiences in life. And those become, as it may seem, filters by which we try to perceive God. So if you try to perceive God through one church versus another church, or one system versus another system, we all come forward with all these different perspectives and views of God. And I want us to do something here, and, and I want to say a couple of things. Number one is that it'll take the Lord to reveal the Lord to you. It, no man can reveal Christ to you, but the Lord will reveal himself to you. And so... Religion can't reveal Christ to you. Church, is this going to sound weird, cannot reveal Christ to you. Can't do it. Did you know that the church can't even give you truth? That truth only comes by the agency of the Holy Spirit to bring an understanding to you. Now, the church can preach the truth, but it can't make you understand the truth, and it can't put it within the concept where you can grasp the truth from a sense of knowing. 
That belongs exclusively to the Lord. So we go out and we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We go to different nations and we preach the gospel. But we know that in the end, in the absolute end of all that, that all we are are the delivery of words that the Holy Spirit must take and convey them into a truth that gives understanding to that individual that will change that individual. Apart from that, we can do absolutely nothing. But we get to see the powerful work of God. We get to see the Lord and the Holy Spirit in the, in the position and the passion of His work change the lives of people. So I want to say something here to you this morning in, in where we're starting at. That it doesn't make any difference where you've been. It doesn't make any difference um, what you have experienced in the past. What your filters have been. It doesn't make any difference what version of the Bible you're reading. My confidence is not in you. And your confidence shouldn't be in yourself. Your confidence should be in what the Lord himself is going to do as you partner with him. Amen. Amen. So here's what Jesus said at the close, and Mark is the very short gospel, but he closes us out and he said to them, go to the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's why I bring my dogs to church sometimes, because he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. It doesn't say who has disbelieved and not been baptized. Water baptism by itself and of itself is not your entry into the kingdom of God, it's the belief in Christ. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Now he gives us some evidence to this, some fruit. In my name they'll cast out demons. That means that God gives them, he gives them authority. Okay, exosia, that's authority. He gives them authority to do this in the, in the knowledge of his name. In my name, in the knowledge of that name, in the intimacy of who he is that you know him by, to that degree of the intimacy that you walk with Jesus, when you encounter these spirits, you'll cast them out. They will speak with new tongues. And he's talking about having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. Serpents, of course, there are some groups in the south, they call them the snake handlers. They take that quite literal, and that's not what the scripture is talking about. Okay. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now we know that these things are of the scriptures. Those things are absolutely true. We see those things happening. So then when the Lord had spoken this to him, he was received up into heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the logos, those spoken words, by the signs that followed. It wasn't rhema, it was logos, that word there. So when they preached the kingdom of God, and they preach the truth. Listen to this carefully on this. If they act upon that logos that they preached about Christ, then the Lord will confirm the words that he speaks according to the truth on that. Now, this next part here comes from, in the scripture, in the Corinthian church, it says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this word fear needs to be defined, because the word fear there means to have a deep reverent, reverential respect. It doesn't mean to fear as in run from God, but when you approach God, you approach Him in, here we go again, in this perception that He is sinless, perfect, holy, righteous, clean, beautiful, but you cannot, you can't have enough words that's going to describe God. So you approach Him in the gravity of what you can comprehend him to be, and he will reveal himself to you. That's why, let's watch this. It doesn't make any difference what country you go in. And I've been to enough of them that when the worship starts, and brand new believers, brand new believers, did you know what the natural reaction is in worship to brand new believers? Is this, when they worship. That is a natural reaction. That's the natural reaction of a child walking up to the parents. They stick their arms out to be picked up. That's the natural reaction. It's not a contrived religious posturing. It's a natural reaction. You never have to tell them, we're going to worship God, and you see them going like this, or when they come into that impacting salvation moment, they just lift their hands up before God like this. 
because this is just a natural statement. It's a universal language that everybody understands for some reason. Until you get into church, and you, then, then it becomes an unnatural reaction that you have to restrain by restraining yourself, holding to the posture of an atmosphere that really is not consistent to the kingdom of God. Okay, that atmosphere is to be, and don't use the excuse of your personality, please, okay? Don't use the excuse. If you've ever cheered anybody on, don't use this excuse. If you've ever lifted your voice and clapped your hands and were happy for something, don't use this excuse. It's your personality not to get excited in church. Because in the presence of God, if you don't like it here, how, I, you're going to be an, the oddball out in heaven. Okay? <laughs> you're going to look like something got morphed. Somehow that got, something changed in heaven and you got passed by. Because it's going to be different in heaven. But let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in the presence of, the God, of God, in which there's absolute joy and praise and peace and thanksgiving, you can't help but animate spirit, soul, and body into the presence of God. You can't do it. And to, to, to restrain yourself in the believers, to restrain yourself is an abnormal reaction. That's like you going and getting married and standing at the altar and looking at your, and looking at your wife going, hmm. Maybe, hmm. You know, and you're, that's an abnormal reaction. You're looking at your wife going, this is awesome. I remember when the Jane and I got married, we were, so I kept looking at her in the plane going, man, this is just awesome. She's my wife. I, you know what? She can't get away anymore. You know? <laughs> There's no elusive opportunity here. She is locked in. I got the contract and the ring on this one. So, and I was happy. It was, you know, I didn't feel prisoned. I felt, I felt this great addition to my life. You know, I don't know, she probably doesn't feel that way sometimes, but I feel that way, felt that way from the, from the moment we sat on the plane until we argue about the shower door, whether we should have a curtain or a sliding shower in the bathroom, and then they can get heated. And so far she's won, so. <laughs> but the reaction to the Lord, the, the normal reaction to God is, is we have to, and, and I'll tell you why this is important as we get forward into this. This reaction before the Lord is the very thing that ushers us into the presence of God that produces the dynamic change that what we're going to be talking about. Now, like I said, it doesn't make any difference the address you've come from or the filter you've come from or what your experience has been in life or what your perceptions have been of God. It doesn't make any difference in that. From this starting point right here, as we come into the presence of God, He defines Himself. And you're not going to make a mistake on that one. But as He defines Himself and you come into His presence, you're going to be in this position of an unspeakable, incomprehensible, I don't know how to do this except to just worship you and tell you I love you. Something's going to change. So here we go. 2 Corinthians 7 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, and we'll talk about what those are that he's referring to, because when you see the word therefore as the opening line of the next verse, it means to go backwards to see what it's there for. Amen? So when you see that word therefore, you go backwards and see what it's there for. These promises. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the, in the fear of the Lord. Okay, can just keep this one position that I'm going to tell you right now. Keep it in the forefront of your thinking from here forward, everything I'm going to tell you. And that is, in the presence of Christ, now you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but in the presence of the Lord, keep this in mind now, there is no condemnation in His presence. Okay? you got to keep that in mind. No matter what your history has been, no matter what it is you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what, you can put all that together in one description called failure, but in the presence of the Lord, because you're in Christ, you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is no condemnation. Amen. Okay? Keep that in mind. But also keep in mind Paul's description of himself 
that as he moved forward into the deeper revelations of the Lord, and as a man who went to heaven and was taken to the third heavens, keep in mind something else. Paul started out in this self-appraisal saying, Paul, he said the apostles. Okay, not bad, you know, considering their foundation apostles. And not bad since he would write two-thirds of the New Testament in the books. Not bad. But then he would go forward in his pilgrimage in life, then he'd say, Paul, least of the brethren. Now he takes himself from the position as apostle, setting foundation from the church, and then puts him in the congregation of those numbered among salvation. And then he says, of those that I'm least. And at the very end of his ministry life, when he's about 65, 68 years old, Paul says something pretty astounding. He says, my conscience bears me witness on this one. Worthy to say this. He said, Paul, chief of sinners. Now, the interesting thing was this. It wasn't that Paul was under condemnation, but that the closer he got to the glory and the comprehension of the glory of God, the more he saw the contrast of the fabric of his humanity and what Jesus saved him from. And then he could say, wow, chief of sinners. So, but no condemnation in the presence of the Lord. Paul never felt condemned when he made that self-appraisal. He didn't feel condemned. He says, let us cleanse ourselves, and that's us cleanse ourselves. There's, a, there's, a, there's something we have to do in this. Although Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's true, absolutely. But there's a partnering with Jesus that he requires of us to cleanse ourselves. From all defilement of the flesh and the spirit. That's interesting in the spirit, since your spirit is saved. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So this thing, perfecting holiness, has a tense in the Greek that says it's an ongoing action that we submit ourselves to, even though we are already seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. So we have two conditions. We have one, well, actually a position and condition, but we have two operations of conditions. The position is that since we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are already justified, we are already sanctified, we are already predestined to come into the likeness of Christ, and the Father has seen us completed sitting in the presence with Christ. Okay, that's what he's done. Amen? Amen. Follow me now. Now watch this. That's, that is a finished condition declaration by God. We would call that our position in Christ. But then over here in this position, we have a command to let us cleanse ourselves. So now we have to do something to move toward, with cooperation in the Spirit, moving toward that position that God has already completed us by. Now follow me how this works. So this perfecting holiness is something that is a cooperation solicitation by you and I in the fear of God. In other words, when you look at that testimony of Bill Weiss, it, it, it compels you to realize what, as the understatement, what the Lord saved you from. And that's just a glimpse that you can't even put into words. But it's enough to say, look how much he loved me that he took on my sin a perfect, holy God without blemish comes in the form of humanity, Jesus Christ, and then takes my sin and puts it on himself. God who knew no sin puts sin on his son. I, I, you, can't. you can't. You can't comprehend it. All you can do is just sort of tickle the concept a little bit and try to get a glimpse of light. Okay? So it says, 2 Corinthians, this is the living Bible, the way it puts it. Having such great promises as these, dear friends, let us turn away from everything wrong, whether of body or spirit, and purify ourselves, living in the wholesome fear of God, giving ourselves to Him alone. So, to Him alone, which means that there are some things that we might be giving ourselves to that we want to change. Places where we put our time. Doing good things get caught in doing and wrapped up in doing good things that God didn't assign you to do is a misplacement of your time. It's a good thing, but it's not necessarily what God told you to do, but it's sucking away your time. I remember one time I was chasing this guy out of foot chase as a police officer, and, and um, they had just 
put that chip seal on the road. You know what that is? That's that little tiny 5P gravel that they, you know, the cars wear it down and it presses itself down into the, into the tar. And, and I was in this foot chase with this guy. And I, we're hauling across, you know, and we went up over this corner, big, huge brick house, cut across the corner lot, come by the driveway, and there's the district judge washing his car. Judge Nicholas, his son is on the state legislature. Bobby, we used to hang out. And I was running across like this, and Judge Nicholas was taking the hose in his car. And I'm running like this, and I said, Your Honor, <laughs> kept on running past him like that. And caught up with this guy. I was never a great sprinter, but I was a good distance runner. And I would just usually keep close enough to the person I was pursuing. And then when he started to tuck her out, I still had good endurance. I would just come up behind him. But the best way to catch him wasn't to try to tackle them, but to come up them when they're, when they're starting to fatigue and you just come up behind them and you push them, <laughs> okay? And then he did this home plate slide across that chip gravel and he looked like fresh hamburger when he stood up. And, and I said, that has got to hurt. And I put the handcuffs on and we're walking by and Judge Nicholas is still hosing off his car. <laughs> And he looks at me and goes, see you in court. <laughs> the way that was. <laughs> it's kind of like we're, we get caught doing something, we get wrapped up in doing something good that we're not supposed to be doing. And the Lord just, he, I mean, the enemy just comes behind us and says, look, if I can't turn you away from the good thing, then I'll encourage you in a good thing as long as it's not the good thing you're supposed to be doing. And so that's why we have to walk before the Lord and really get before the Lord in, in giving thanks and to Him and Him alone is to get the assignment from the Lord. So 2 Corinthians says this, and I will be, the promises now, he says, I'll be a father to you and you'll be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. That's pretty, now he's talking about a very, very deep personal relationship here. Personal relationship where you would call your parents at any one moment in time when you were a little kid and you expected them to be there and they were goes on because for we are the temple of the, of the living God our bodies just as God said I will dwell in them and walk among them and I'll be their God and they will be my people that's very possessory now you stop and you think about those who cannot say that who will never be able to say that who have no hope and they walk the earth right now statistically speaking every three people you pass out of four are on the registry of hell and are destined to an experience like something like what Bill Weiss described in that video we watched. And it's incomprehensible. Some of the greatest joy I have when I go to Africa isn't the seeing of the miracles that take place. It's really, I mean, I, I love the miracles when they happen. I love to see the Lord perform healings in people. I like that. But the biggest thrill is to watch hundreds of people come to the altar and give their life to Jesus. And know that their lives are changed. And to know that that was the work of God, that you could not produce that. It was something you could stand back after you preached the word of God. And then you watched the Holy Spirit take your words and turn them into a living truth that got into their hearts. And that he brought them around to the understanding that they needed Jesus Christ. And it, it is literally walk, sitting back in your seat and watching God do what God did when a whole village comes to Christ. And you know, and you're very relaxed. You know you didn't do anything. All you did was you were just, you know, the speaker through the system. That was it. So 2 Corinthians says this, Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness. This is those things that, you know, if we go back a couple here, he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. Then he goes over and he amplifies this. Do not be bound, unto, bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Partnership, fellowship, harmony, and in common. It's all got to go toward the direction of the Lord. Now, it didn't tell you that you had to get out of the world and avoid people. He's talking about bound together. You work with people, you're not bound together with them. 
You're around the unsaved, but you're not bound together with them. To, be, to bind yourself to somebody, it's more than just a casual bump of the shoulder or doing something as a co-worker. So that's not what he's talking about. But to bind yourself together is an elective position that you choose. That's something you choose to do. And he's saying, look, that's not going to work. As a Christian, be careful what you align yourself with, whether you are the one influencing or the one being influenced. So you need to make that decision and, and do the analysis of that, of that. Jesus went to the house of sinners and ate, but he was the one who was influencing. He was not influenced by them. He went to people who were unbelievers and talked to them. But his presence transformed their lives. He was never transformed by their presence. Big difference in that. So let's look at this thing called love and legalism, because they look the same. See if you can, can grasp it. The actions of love are zealous, detailed considerations given through self-sacrifice and motiva motivated to the benefit of another. That's what it is. Love is giving to others at the cost of self. Lust is taking from others at the benefit of self. So if I'm going to be in a love-based relationship with the Father, then there are things that I want to do with God to His benefit that are going to be sacrifices of my time or sacrifices of, the, of who I am and what I'm doing. So what am I going to do to get into the presence of God. Well, you can't make time, but you can only take time. Just remember that. You cannot make time for anything, but you can take time for things. You only got 24-7. So you're going to have to look at your life and your schedules and what you're aligning yourself with. And this is between you and the Lord. Nobody can hand you a cookie-cutter prescription that fits all people. And so what you do is you get along, along with the Lord and say, what do I need to do in seeking the Lord to, to, to understand His presence. And I don't care, like as I said before, you're going to come into His presence and there's no condemnation, and you are going to come into His presence because you choose to. And you cannot cleanse yourself, but you can cleanse yourself by the partnership of Jesus. So Daniel, what did he do? Three days, three times a day, in Daniel, he would go up and he would open up the windows facing Jerusalem and he would pray three times a day. Now, some people would call that legalism. It's not legalism. That was his love for God to get in the presence of the Lord and worship him. That may be Daniel. That's not necessarily me. And so if I said, okay, we all have to be like Daniel, and we all have to fast 21 days, and we all have to open up our windows and, you know, face Jerusalem and pray three times a day, if that's not coming from a love, then that becomes legalism. But if it's love... That's what Daniel did. He opened up his windows. And he faced Jerusalem that he was taken from. And he, and he worshipped the Lord. Three times a day. That was a love expression, not a legalistic thing. There might be some things that you did in the beginning of your Christian walk. What did you do? You might have found yourself pouring into God's word. You might have found yourself praying a whole lot more. You might have found yourself doing some things, getting along with God a whole lot more and setting certain things aside that you found yourself doing that maybe you have picked them back up again. And maybe you're not praying as much and maybe you're not as invested as much. Did your love grow cold? See, that's what happened in the Ephesian church. They got into the machinery of ministry and they had all these really great things that the Lord said in the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. And then he gets to the bottom line, he says, but I have this against you that you left your first love. You did all these works, but you forgot who they were for. And so we make religion of things and we lose the relationship. And what we want to do is go back to the relationship. And we want to find ourselves before the Lord, not through legalism, but motivated by love, zealous detailed considerations, that we will sacrifice ourselves to do to find Jesus or to enjoy his presence or to invest in seeking him. So love and legalism, self-sacrifice appears to others who are outside the motivation of love as little more than legalism. Do you know why uh, I, Jane and I, we take joy in the tithe and offering because we don't find it legalistic. We find it joyful. We find it joyful to be able to convey the gospel 
in the translated form from money or sometimes objects of different things. We've given away various different things to people. We save our money and we, go to, we spend that money and we go to Africa. And we're able to help people. And you have given contributions that I've taken to Africa. And you know, you remember Rose Phobia, the, the prostitute that I met in Ghana. And look at that love that was handed there. This girl who has no idea, no concept, who has more, had, had more men in her early late 20s, early 30s than she possibly could count. Two children. No hope. And then spontaneously on a Thursday night that you didn't even know she was in a call from Africa, which in her time was 2 a.m. And there you are at 7 o'clock and she needs her rent paid because in Africa you have to pay two to three years in advance. And she needed school clothes for her children and she needed her children's school fees to be paid. And she needed food. And there on the spot, and this came from the virtue of Jesus Christ, you threw in $1,627. And you bought this woman a freezer, you, and uh, her rent was paid for three years. You know what kind of burden that comes off of her to have to come up with that kind of money? She held $1,627 in her hand, and she called me up, and she says, I have never had this much money in my hand at a single time in my entire life. And all she could do was weep and cry and weep and cry. And it was the gratitude of thanksgiving that came from a very spontaneous moment that you had no advanced knowledge that she was going to call from Africa because I was driving in my patrol car when she called. And I said, Rose, I said, I'm going to have you call me at 7 o'clock tonight, which is 2 o'clock in the morning your time. And I said, and I'm going to have you share your testimony with our Thursday night blue jeans and t-shirt, Bible study, food fest, get together thing, I'm a jig. And, and that came out of it. And it was great. And to me, that speaks about the proof of the love of Jesus Christ. And so, the self-sacrifice that you have in your life, if you tried to mimic that in somebody else's life, or see something, I remember one time talking to Mario and we were talking about prayer and he goes <laughs> you know you hear these people say I pray 8 to 10 hours a day Mario says I don't have time to pray 8 to 10, hour, 8 to 10 hours a day I have a life to live and a ministry to run he says but I get alone with God and I pray you know and so it's not a formula because when it becomes a formula then it becomes legalism or it's not a mandated thing you have to do but, but you, you know so it's because of who the uniqueness and the beautiful person that you are that God made that he wants in his presence he doesn't want cookie cutters no clones he wants you you and who you are with all the network of everything that make you who you are he enjoys your presence and how you speak to him and how you approach him and he enjoys that <laughs> Larnell Harris wrote the song, I Miss My Time With You, came from an experience where he would set up an attic. And I don't pray this way, but this is the way he did. And he had an empty chair sitting across from a table, and he would go up there and act like Jesus was sitting there. And he would talk to the Lord as if the Lord was sitting there. That was his form of prayer. Okay, I, I don't know. I think I'd, I couldn't. I can't do that. But that's the way he did. And so it had been a long time since he'd been up in the attic praying in that manner. And he decided one time after his busy schedule and recording artists and everything else that was going on, he thought he'd go up there. And as he did, he bows his head at the table and starts to pray as if Jesus is there. He looks and there's the Lord sitting there. And he said, Larnell, he goes, I miss my time with you. And that's what birthed that song, I miss my time with you. He had an actual experience of the Lord's presence where the Lord said, I miss my time with you when Larnell and him would, would pray. And have that fellowship. But if I tried to mimic Larnell Harris, I might find myself wrapped up in some method that I don't feel that that's me. So self sacrifice appears to others who are outside that motivation of love as, a little bit, as something a little more than legalism. You're going to find that what you do before the Lord should be done out of the strongest motivation that you love Jesus. That's why Christ said, if you love me, watch this in the affirmative sense, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now that sounds like legalism. So let's, let's amplify that as to the intent of what he's saying. 
if you love me, by the power of that love that you have within yourself for me, that will give the strength that you have in joyous desire to obey my commandments. That's what that means. It means that as I love Christ, His commandments aren't burdensome for me. I find myself in delight to be pleasing to Him. And so because of my love for Him, as the Spirit of God speaks to me, then I am able to obey Him. But if I don't have love for Him, if I'm just wrapped up in this religious burrito, you know, and I'm sitting there trying to figure out what I'm going to do, you know, there's no life in a burrito. I mean, stop and think about it. Don't try to envision a burrito right now. <laughs> but stop and think about having to obey God's love just on this hardcore format. I've got to love God with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength and everything is with me. I'm going to love Him. <laughs> and there's no joy in that. There's no signature or anything like that. And then you can't figure out why it's so hard to obey God. Well... So let's go back and cultivate the love. And then the commandments will be easy to follow. Whatever those are, as the way the Holy Spirit speaks to your life about you. Because there are commandments that God gives you that are not in the scripture per se. If God says to you, put down the TV and pray, if he said to do it, you better do it, and that's a commandment from him. Okay, but it's not in the Ten Commandments, and it's not in scripture, because TV's not listed here. But it is a moment in time where God says, I want you to put down the internet. I want you to starve or fast off the internet for, for 20 days and just be alone with me. I want you to pull out of the pollutions of this world and then seek me. Now those are individual commands that he speaks to you to coach you into the presence of God. That's what that's for. So cleansing ourselves. The ambition freely given to do what is pleasing or displeasing to the Lord in order that we have unblemished fellowship. That's, what, that's how we cleanse ourselves. It's an ambition, but it comes from love. That we freely give to God to do what is pleasing or to stop what is displeasing to the Lord in order that we have unblemished fellowship. So, if you're doing something, now watch this, you can be displeasing to God doing something that looks rather benign and not bad. But it may be displeasing to the Lord. It's probably more where you spend your time and your investment. Where you spend your focus. I had a guy last night that angered me rather. And I made him pay. So at 8.30 at night, I get this call. The lady picks up two great Pyrenees. And I had just gotten in the house and just taken off my uniform and just taken off my, my, my shirt and everything else. I was relaxed and the phone rings. Bing, and I got to get redressed and everything. And then go back to the shelter to meet this lady who captured these two great Pyrenees. And thank God that she did. If my dog was loose and someone did that, I would be deep, deeply appreciated. And she brings the Pyrenees up to me. And so these are large, pretty large dogs. They're like... Uh, Albino St. Bernard's, okay? And so I had to take them out of the truck, and they're very friendly, thankfully. And then I bring them into the shelter. And while I'm in the shelter, I'm filling out the paperwork on the impound information, and the phone rings. And this guy gets on the phone, and he says, he says, uh, I, do you have a couple of puppies there at the shelter? Okay, now if I'm trying to describe an adult to you, would I, call it, would I describe a child? And I said, I don't think we have any puppies here at the shelter right now. This is like, now we're cruising toward 9 p.m. And I said, what are you looking for? He goes, well, I said, I'm looking for my dog. One's two, one, three years old. I said, oh. I said, those are adult dogs. And he goes, well, excuse me, my bad, Mr. Officer. <laughs> you know what? When you got the pin and you issue the pink, don't make the cop mad. Amen. And I'm sitting there <laughs> Chet, you know that one, don't you? <laughs> and so he started inside. He, I said, well, I said, uh, so I've got two Pyrenees here. Is that what you're looking for? He goes, yes. He goes, did you scan them? I said, I am doing the paperwork right now. He goes, then what good is the chip is if you didn't scan them? 
And I said, because they will scan them in the morning for you and call you. Then what good does the chip do if you didn't scan them? I was told I could have them back. He's got no position here. And I very expressly told him, I said, um, look, I said, your dogs are at large. There's no, no display of rabies tags that are required by the city ordinance to have on your dogs. I said, so this conversation's over with. I said, you can come pick up your dogs at the shelter. We're done right now, and you can pick up your four citations when you get here. Click. So what was, could have been to him a moment where grace would have been handed to him, and he could have called me up and said, oh, I'm so sorry, I can be right there. I would have waited for 10, 15 minutes and give his dogs back to him. Instead, he's probably up the shelter here at about 15 minutes, going to pay $540 to pick up his dogs. Now look what happened here. The guy comes up aggressive and angry, sullen, accusative, sarcastic, and he doesn't have any authority to stand on. And I thought to myself, when I wrote the citations out, thinking, I'm going to write, sit here, I'm going to write four citations out when I'd rather be at home. But he's going to get these four citations. And he's going to pay two days kenneling, kenneling, two dogs, $150 a day. He's going to pay $300 to get the dogs out. He's going to pay another $240 in fines. That's just the bonds. Or he could have been nice and gotten it for zero. Now, I want to stop and, and use a parallel of analysis here for this. How do you look at God? Do you look at him as a guy who can write the pink slips on you all the day long? Or do you look at the Lord who that you can appeal to by looking at him and saying, I want to praise you and I worship you, God, knowing exactly who I am and my faults and failures and everything else. And then you come into the presence of God without condemnation. You come into the presence of God as one who will receive you, but you're going to come into the presence of God the way he says to come into his presence. Not the way you feel religiously, but the way he, you should respect him and come into that presence. And then he will entreat you and he will receive you. It is to compare gains and losses. So stop and think about it, cleansing yourself. Of the thing that you don't want to release and the thing that you don't want to do or the thing you don't want to give attention to, or that which you don't want to get into the presence of God, or that which you don't want to address or bring before the altar of the Lord, whatever it is that you don't want to do, if you want to maintain that in your life, estimate what that loss is against the gain of walking out of it toward, and, and coming into the presence of God. So everything you're going to do is based upon a gain or a loss. If I walk away from these things that are displeasing to God, that becomes a gain that I might not realize right away. What I realize right away is that it's a loss in my life because sin has pleasure, does it not? Huh? Come on, sin has pleasure? How many times? Yes. Huh? Yeah, it does. Okay. <laughs> Got one lone voice like truthful out there. Okay. <laughs> so sin has pleasure, that's what it says. Okay. And you, that's a loss to walk away from a pleasure. But it's actually a gain to walk away from that in time as that anchor and all that debris and all that periphery and all that parasitical drag in your life is cut away and you're going streamlined in the spirit into the blessings and into the presence of God and the security and the favor of the Lord. But, it doesn't, but walking away is right now, but coming into the gains is not necessarily right instantly. So stop and you think about your gains and losses, but every day that you continue holding on to the thing that's dragging you down is a continual loss and actually no gain in heaven. No gain before the Lord, no gain in this present life. So the scripture talks about cleansing ourselves. It's what it talks about. Let's cleanse ourselves. Let's don't have any binding of anything else together that was not supposed to be into our life. But let's cleanse ourselves. Now look at this here. We want to know him, right? So let's start with the knowns of conscience. These are things that you know that are presently in your life. You, you know them. Things that you shouldn't be doing. Okay, or things that you're doing that you know are pleasing to the Lord. But your conscience dictates that to you. You pray? Good. Does God want you to pray more? Now, we think of prayer as a rigor, religious thing. And I, and I, and I think about going into the Catholic Church and then people just sit there. 
and everything's quiet. And you stop and you, you know, do a little dabby do with the holy water. Then you go on over there and you sit and find your place in the seat. You go light a candle and you start muttering your Hail Marys and Our Fathers. And you think you've gotten the place of the Lord. And that's not it at all. It's not, it's not at all going to do it. Now you're stuck in a religion. You go, I can't get any juice out of this thing. No, it doesn't because that's not, that's, you're in a structure. You're not in the place in the presence of the free-flowing move of the Spirit. So we'll start your knowns of conscience. Now, you get into that known conscience thing, and then you start getting into condemnation. Oh, I too much peanut butter on bread. I didn't get much. To, I didn't feed the birds this morning, as I as they typically do. I, I didn't. You know what? Those poor rabbits that are out there suffering in the snow. I, I mean, what am I doing? I, you know, I, I shouldn't live in this warm house. And you get all these ridiculous things of performance that you're condemning yourself with. And that's why you got to get a hold of the Lord and figure out what He's telling you to do. I mean, it's got to be the Lord's prescription. Otherwise, you will just beat yourself down under legalism. So, we want to be motivated by dependence upon Christ. So, we're going to get in the presence of the Lord. And in that place called prayer, a lot of times it's not asking God anything. It's declaring some wonderful things. So, we've got to get into His presence. He says, for you are the Lord most high over all the earth, and you are exalted above all gods. Did you ever stop at verse 9 and just spend time on exalting the greatness of God? Trying, you know, the homologeo, you know what that means? That's that fancy little word, homologeo. Homo meaning same, legeo meaning words or confession. Say the same thing that God says. So you get in the presence of God. And, you know, Jane left this morning on a prayer drive. And she ended up at Albertsons and the most hideous donuts and pastries that we've ever had in this church. They're back there and I guarantee you no one's going to touch them. So she was not in the spirit when she bought those pastries. I can promise you that. <laughs> but she did go to a prayer drive this morning. Okay. Before church started. And you must have been up in heaven when you mindlessly bought those pastries. <laughs> so anyway... As you hone that accuracy of the Spirit, you'll make right decisions, right? <laughs> I know, Dan, I better quit right now, right? <laughs> you know, shut your mouth. <laughs> get in the Spirit, Don, get in the Spirit. <laughs> survive, survive. <laughs> what? I, haven't, I looked at him and walked away. I thought, I'd be, that looks like roadkill back there. I mean, they're... They're what? <laughs> they're what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lord help me. <laughs> the best donuts are over there at that little Korean place that they start sell sushi and donuts together. <laughs> anyway, it's right there next to McDonald's, by the way. I put a plug in for him. Um, so you get in the presence of God. And just spend time exalting his greatness and, and the majesty of who he is. I mean, you can get lost in trying to just homologeo. God, you are wonderful. You're beautiful. You're great. You are majestic. Father, your beauty can't be compared to anything. Lord, your greatness. Father, your justice, your decisions are perfect. Lord, they are absolutely perfect. Your judgments are flawless, God. And you start exalting his name above all the earth. He says, hate Evil, you who love the Lord, notice the contrast between the two motivations, who preserve the souls of his godly ones, he delivers them from the hand of the wicked. That, you know, I'm going to tell you something, listen, your greatest enemy is not Satan, it's you. Amen? Amen. God will deliver you from yourself as you keep submitting yourself to him. Because he will change you where, he will, where, where Jesus said, now the, now the prince of this world is judged, and he has nothing in me. There was nothing, there was no handle that Satan could put in Jesus that could influence him. And as God matures you in Christ, he keeps removing that, those handles that the enemy likes to flip and, and activate and twitch you with. Until finally he gets you to a place where that temptation that used to get you, has no longer any power over you anymore because you've moved beyond that into the strength of Christ. 
So he delivers you from the hand of the wicked, but more precisely, he delivers you from you so that the wicked can't have you anymore. Light is sown like seed for the righteous and gladness for the upright of heart. Be glad in the Lord, you his righteous ones, and give thanks to his holy name. Look at this now. His presence draws you into his love. That's what's going to happen here. So we remember we talked about these commandment things and cleansing ourselves and all that kind of stuff. If you want to see that happen, come into the presence of God and he'll do this with you. But you try to stay outside the presence of God and walk in this recipe of obedience, you're not going to make it. This is not that you have no strength to do that or you didn't need Jesus from the beginning. So all the strength is going to come from being in the presence of God. And in that presence, you will draw upon His strength and He will do the changing in you. So you got to seek Him. And that seeking Him is what? I'm going to say something to you. If all you do is read and don't pray, you're missing it. If all you do is pray and don't read, you're missing it. There's a balance in this. But in the beginning, I'm going to suggest something to you. Spend more time in the praise and the worship and seeking Him and then start reading the Word of God. But if you just get caught in the reading of the Word of God, dissecting it hermeneutically, energetically, exegetically, and you're looking at it all this thing the 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 theoretically and looking at it in orthodox, and you haven't been in His presence, all you've done is chop up God in a thousand pieces and you're no closer to Him. You've got to know him in his presence. And then when you read this word, it becomes living life reflecting the person you've just been with. You've got to be in the presence of God. Give thanks and recognition to him. You can spend hours doing that, folks. You can start out entering into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, is what the psalm says. And then you go into the Holy of Holies. So stop. Give thanks. Give thanks to God. Give thanks and give praise to Him. Recognize Him. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. What you've got in your life is good. You got a coat on? That's good. It's wintertime. Got gas in your tank? That's good. That's how you got down here. You got intelligence, health, life. You got a job? Those are all good things. You got friends? You got a church? Good things. You can go on and on and on and on. How many of you ate with your fingers this morning? <laughs> right? God gave you silverware. Or at least stainless steelware. Yep. We what? I think those donuts came out of hell somewhere. <laughs> they are nasty looking things. <laughs> but the Lord says, give thanks in all things, not for all things. So just remember that. <laughs> it says, praise him for his praise him for his goodness. You know, think of the goodness of God. Think of all the things and how He has long patience, suffering, how, how His mercy is lavished over your life, how He's preserved you in the moments of continued stupidity. <laughs> think about that. No comment, James. <laughs> but praise Him for His goodness. Declare His righteousness. Declare that He is God above all, perfect in all of His ways. His judgments are absolutely perfect. Think of his righteousness. Think of how truth comes from God. All truth is parallel. Satan has no truth in him is what John 8 says. Think about truth coming into your life. Think about how equity follows and injustice. Think about those things. Think about the righteousness of the kingdom. That God doesn't change. That when you pray, you have faith in him because you know he's consistent. He doesn't change. And you can, you, can, you can place all the weight of your hope on that. Declare His righteousness. He creates love within you. Isn't that interesting? He's the one that romances you into His heart. So as you get into His presence, He creates that love inside you that draws you to Him as He allows you to discover Him so that you're drawn deeper into Him. And the more you get drawn into the Lord, the more you want Him and the more you want to walk with him and his commandments then become less and less burdensome and you see his righteousness and you see his truth and you want to walk away from those things that are that are dastardly and destructive and death you have now you see them for what they are and you go why did i ever stop the ice cream truck for that 
And you look at you go, I don't want this. This can't be in my life. You walk away from it. But you couldn't do that before. And you can't do it into the future, the things that God wants to change you do, until you get into that place where God creates that love inside you. He does that if you get in His presence. So it's not a formula, folks. Listen, it's not a formula. You get into the presence of God, and He'll start talking with you without condemnation, and He'll start drawing you into Him. And then you'll start making those discoveries, and your life will change in His presence. Amen? Amen? It'll change in the presence. Love is the force that creates the change. Your love, discovery for your love, deepening love in Christ, creates the change in you. It's not legalism, it's not rules, it's not this and that. It's not regimented things. It's the love that you have for God that changes the force. His word is the light. And the reason why this is paired together, love is the force that creates change because you have to define love. If love, watch this, if love were everything based upon the detail that you want it to be and it had no truth in it, then you could make love anything you want it. But it's not. So his word is the light that guides the love. That's what guides the love. That's what defines God's love is his word. Amen? Amen. We're going to worship. We've got three, four songs. That's it. But at any point in time that you want prayer during this worship, you just come up to the front. We will pray for you during the worship. If that ever thing. But I'm going to say something to you. If you'll just do what we said right here. If you'll just do this. I promise you miracles. I promise you changes. I promise you guidance and leading in the Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's stand up before the Lord. And let's just open this up with thanksgiving before Father.